In early 2020, we are witnessing events that will, no doubt, end up in history books. As a result of the coronavirus outbreak, entire countries around the world are going into complete lockdown to prevent and delay the spread of the disease. London, like most of the other big cities around the world, is locked. The normally bustling and never resting world capital now reminds of a sci-fi film location. Eerie, empty streets, deserted airports, and closed public areas. We often hear people saying the world will never be the same again. But we often forget that through history, this city has seen some horrible virus outbreaks, and this is probably the best time to have a look back and see how London has dealt with them. The Great Plague of London, 17th century. Three of the deadliest pandemics in recorded history were caused by a single bacterium, Yersinia pestis, an infection also known as the plague. Its first wave around the world happened in 541, killing an estimated 30 to 50 million people, perhaps half of the world's population of that time. The plague never fully disappeared since then. It came back and hit Europe 800 years later, in 1347. This wave is known as the Black Death, and it took away 200 million lives in just four years. London, however, never really caught a break after the Black Death. The plague was resurfacing roughly every 20 years, 40 outbreaks in 300 years. By the early 1500s, England imposed the first laws to separate and isolate the sick. Homes stricken by the plague were marked with a bale of hay strung to a pole outside. If you had infected family members, you had to carry a white pole when you went out in public. Cats and dogs were believed to carry the disease, so there was a wholesale massacre of hundreds of thousands of animals. The last and one of the biggest outbreaks happened in 1665, which is known as the Great Plague of London. It started in May in the poor, overcrowded parish of St. Giles in the Field. The disease spread so quickly that by the end of summer, 15% of the population perished. The king, Charles II, and his court left London and fled to Oxford. Those people who could had sent their families away from London during these months, but the poor had no recourse but to stay. Incubation took a mere four to six days, and when the plague appeared in a household, the house was sealed, thus condemning the whole family to death. These houses were distinguished by a painted red cross on the door and the words, Lord have mercy on us. At night, special carts were circulating the streets of the city. Bring out your dead, the cart riders were screaming, and family members were bringing out the corpses of those who died that day. The carts were carrying the bodies to the plague pits located on the outskirts of the city. London had two main plague pits where the bodies were being buried every day, at Aldgate and at Finsbury Fields. As cruel as it was to shut up the sick in their homes and bury the dead in mass graves, it may have been the only way to bring the last great plague outbreak to an end. Next year, another horrific event hit the city, the Great Fire of 1666. One of the most destructive events of the city is believed to have a great impact on slowing down the spread of the disease by killing off the plague-ridden fleas. And although Black Death resurfaced for a few more times in the next centuries, London and Britain took a breath from the epidemics, but not for too long. Cholera, 19th century. In the early 19th century, cholera was raging across England, killing tens of thousands. The prevailing scientific theory of the day said that the disease was spread by foul air known as a miasma, but a British doctor named John Snow had a different theory. He suspected that the mysterious disease, which killed its victims within days of the first symptoms, was lurking in London's drinking water. Snow started a long and detailed investigation. He was researching hospital records and morgue reports to track the precise locations of deadly outbreaks. He created a geographic chart of cholera deaths over a 10-day period and found a cluster of 500 fatal infections around the Broad Street Pump, a popular city well for drinking water. Snow was strongly convinced that the source of cholera was the drinking water that Londoners were using every day. He convinced the local authorities to remove the pump handle on the Broad Street City well, and it became unusable for some time. Like magic, the infections dried up. And although this didn't cure cholera overnight, John Snow's work led to a global effort to improve urban sanitation and protect drinking water from contamination. London was slowly recovering, despite diseases and viruses still being an issue. People gradually started to believe that science and developing medicine won't let anything like the Great Plague happen again. Little did they know that several decades later, in 1918, 
An unknown virus would bring the world to its knees, resulting in the most devastating pandemics ever recorded. It was the end of World War I, in 1918, when British soldiers started to return home from the trenches. Some of them were showing symptoms of a mild disease, such as sore throats, headaches, and a loss of appetite. Recovery was usually swift, and doctors at first called it three-day fever. In reality, it was something much worse. Spanish Flu, 1918. This new airborne virus was nicknamed Spanish Flu as the first reported cases were in Spain. One of the first casualties was the King of Spain. Returning from northern France at the end of the war, the British troops traveled home by train. As they arrived at the railway stations, the flu spread from the railway stations to the center of the cities, then to the suburbs and out into the countryside. Young adults between 20 and 30 years old were particularly affected and the disease struck and progressed quickly in these cases. Those who were fine and healthy in the morning could be dead by the afternoon. After death, patients' corpses would turn completely black, which must have been terrible for their loved ones. London was completely overwhelmed by the epidemic. Hospitals were filled with victims coming back from the continent, and so many soldiers who had bravely survived the trenches could not beat the flu bug. Hospitals were overcrowded, and doctors and nurses worked to breaking point, although there was little they could do realistically to help patients as there was no cure for the flu. One of the most tragic things about the Spanish flu is that the kind of social isolation and distancing that could have stopped its spread, which is currently being enforced against coronavirus, was not put in place. Big victory celebrations to mark the end of the war still took place, and the virus ripped through them like wildfire. National Health Service didn't exist in the UK at the time, so the response to the outbreak was not coordinated and could be completely different from city to city. Every town relied on its existing hospitals to tackle the virus in their own way, and they were very badly equipped. There was no effective coordination from the central government. In fact, the government was mostly ignoring the existence of epidemics for quite some time. The disease was not mentioned in Parliament until late October 1918, and local authorities were not officially notified until the third wave of flu struck in early 1919. Scientists now believe the virus mutated a number of times before the pandemic died down. By the summer of 1919, when the flu pandemic subsided, 228,000 people had died in Britain. The way London dealt with the virus has some important lessons for how we are dealing with coronavirus today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and make sure to check out some of our other videos about London.